I should say as a, as a disclaimer that I spent about 15 years working for Privacy International and other international uh, privacy groups uh, before I came to Article 19, so I haven't quite been converted uh, fully to the cause, and my colleague Gabrielle uh, frequently has to try and, if so if she see, see her vault, uh, vaulting over the chairs to try and stop me <laughs> from saying something, uh, that's why. Um, let me just start, I decided as I was coming down on the, on the tube this morning to, um, to read an old paper I hadn't, uh, I hadn't gotten around to reading before, but it had a couple of interesting points, and uh, it started out with a, with a quote that I thought was quite, um, quite striking about uh, started with recent inventions and in business methods call attention to the next step which must be taken for the protection of the person to secure the right of the individual for the right to be left alone. And that numerous devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. Somewhat, you know, provocative language, though it was actually written in 1890 by Justice, the future Justice Brandeis uh, and his brother, uh, Samuel Warren. Uh, so this isn't a new debate. And, and if you go back and you look at the, the paper, it's really quite prescient in many ways. It talks about the balancing of freedom of expression and privacy, uh, about how the right of privacy, quote, <coughs> does not prohibit any publication of matter which is of a public or general interest. Uh, the design of the law uh, must be to protect those whose affairs the community has no legitimate concern from being dragged into an undesirable and undesired publicity and to protect all persons uh, from having matters which they may properly refer, prefer to keep private made public against their will. So I mean this was clearly a, a concern now a hundred and Five years ago, or something. I don't know. I'm a lawyer. I can't figure out these numbers. <laughs> um, so, I mean, clearly, this was something that uh, has been in debate for a long time. Maybe not in hot debate, but uh, you know, this law review is considered one of the most influential in the history of, of law reviews. I think we've heard a lot about the U.S. versus EU. How different cultures deal with it in different ways. And I actually think that's a bit of a false description of the, of the debate. Because if you look globally, uh, there's now about 110 countries around the world who have data protection laws. So most of Latin America has a data protection law now. Uh, a fair whack of Africa. There's even a couple of, of uh, international conventions, regional conventions for Africa that have laws. Um, fair number of Asian countries now have laws. So it's not a U.S. versus Europe. It's actually kind of a U.S. versus the rest of the world <laughs> debate at this point. Uh, I do a map, which you can find online if you look at SSRN, and there's a giant black hole where the U.S. is. And the rest of the world has nice green colors or nice yellow colors because they're considering something. And then there's a giant black hole uh, for, for, for the U.S. and uh, uh, so it's good to think of it in that context. So the, the old debate of whether it's you know European countries, a few of them have data protection laws. Well, it's pretty much every country except Belarus and Turkey now. Uh, maybe one or two other small ones have laws in, in Europe and all these other countries around the world. Um, and they're all really quite similar. They're very similar to what we've been talking about here. And they don't, none of them, unless maybe one of the new ones says anything about the right to be forgotten, but they all have this right of giving the individual the ability to challenge the processing of information that's irrelevant, out of date, uh, and so on. So it's you know also important to think of it that way. Now getting to the issue of the ECJ case, I completely agree that they, they completely bollocked up the issue of balancing. Uh, I was looking more at paragraph 97 than 81, but whichever is your favorite paragraph, you can call it that one. Um, but they say, quote, these rights override as a rule not only the economic interest of the operator of the search engine, but also the interest of the general public in finding that information. 
That is just a complete missing of any number of things. Other than that, I wasn't particularly surprised by the decision. Google as a processor, that was pretty straightforward. As a, you know, if you looked at the any of the case law or the, you know, what the definition of processing is under the EU or under a hundred odd laws out there, uh, what Google was doing was clearly processing it. They weren't just passing it on. They weren't an ISP that was just uh, had nothing to do with the content. They clearly were doing something to the content to then make it digestible to use for the search engine for people to find. So the problem is really. Paragraph 81, paragraph 97, maybe both of them. I think 97 is just more uh, reiteration of it. They managed to miss the free expression uh, discussion altogether, which isn't terribly surprising in the case of the ECJ because they've never really had that much to think about free expression. Uh, they've had a lot of cases on data protection over the years, uh, but free expression is not something uh, that they've really had to uh, ever deal with uh, particularly much and uh, so clearly they, they bollocked it up. Um, you know, they've done some decent stuff on privacy. The decision against the data retention directive uh, was quite good, which usually they kind of bollocks up privacy decisions too. So <laughs> for that one, they did a decent job. Uh, we'll see what happened with uh, in the next couple of weeks with, with uh, Schrems, or at least what the uh, Advocate General says. Um, but I think it's also a bit of an uh, unfair um, thing, if I can respond to Frank slightly, that uh, they were expected to solve all the data protection problems in this particular case. They got what they got. They were asked to address one particular thing, they addressed it, they didn't address it that great. Shrems will address another bit of it. That's kind of the way it is. You know, they're not going to do that. That's a political issue. That's what the EU Council and the EU Commission and the EU Parliament are supposed to be doing. And in part, they are doing that. Um, we've been sort of tangentially involved in the debates over the uh, new directive and been following it fairly closely. And they do address in quite a few ways uh, the issues. I mean, they do have a specific right of, to be forgotten in there now, so no longer being something that's uh, coming out of another right, but, but specifically in there. Uh, they do now, in almost the first uh, recital, say that the right of privacy is not an absolute right. It has to be balanced with other fundamental rights of based on the principle of proportionality. So the decision coming when it did was good timing because as the debate was going on about the regulation, this then became a much more important issue and was debated. If you look at the, well, there's 600 odd reservations still. Uh, there were something like 2,000 uh, amendments done by the parliament uh, or considered by the parliament, they only I think, voted on about 300 of them. Uh, so, you know, there is that concern now. There is a lot more now in the revised directive than there ever was in the original directive about freedom of expression and about access and government transparency. I'm not saying it's going to resolve it, uh, the problems, but, you know, laws are going to be abused by powerful people no matter what they say. So when you say there's this new trend towards data protection, actually I remember hearing that about 10 years ago. You know, it was, and even longer than that, these companies are abusing data protection to prevent X, Y, Z. It's not a new problem. It's really up to the courts, well it's up to the, hopefully the bodies to write clear laws, which sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But it's also up to the courts to coherently respond to those and for the information commissioner to coherently respond and to do something useful and tell them not to do that. That's not an argument there shouldn't be a law, it's an argument that the law should be recognized in the spirit and what it's supposed to do, not what somebody is trying to stretch it to do. Um, 
I'm not sure I have much else to say. Um, <laughs> oh, well, actually, there was one or two other points I want to say. The, the issue of who should deal with the uh, redactions or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase them, whether Google is given more power now than it had before. And I really don't actually think Google is given more power by responding to this. Google always had the completely arbitrary power to add and delete anything it ever wanted to do from the uh, from its its databases, and it did it in any number of ways, as do all these other companies. Sort of um, somewhat of an amusing example relating to us. Uh, on Facebook, we have an official page. And we tweeted something out about a new human rights report on Syria a couple months ago. Well, probably about a year ago now. And somebody complained to, and linked to, the, to this human rights report, somebody complained to Facebook that uh, our, our uh, site was now promoting hate speech or something like that because we had a thing. And, and Facebook just took down our, just disappeared our <coughs> post. On, on Syria arbitrarily and then didn't want to respond to us when we, when we did it. We managed to get it mentioned in The Guardian, so they kind of responded a little quicker then. <laughs> and, uh, but they really have the power to do whatever they please. Um, so I don't see this as giving them more power. I mean, yes, obviously the state has this obligation, and they do have that through the Data Protection Commissions, which anybody, I believe any processor of personal data. For the interest of the person, and this is a standard principle of data protection, you go to the people who are processing it first and you say, fix this. Whether it's a legitimate case or not, you go to that, you can go to that person first. It's a lot more useful for the person to be able to do that than to go to court, which is expensive, uh, especially in the case of data protection where uh, if you can't get the commission to do anything, uh, you have to actually go to court. You can't go to the tribunal, unlike freedom of information. So the commission's powers are weaker than most others uh, if you can't get them to do something. So you go to the people who are causing the problem and try and get them to solve it. If they don't solve it, you still have that fundamental right to go to the commission and uh, get them to do something. I agree. Another method that would be easier, faster, I'm always a little skeptical of multi-stakeholder as a thing. I think it's, it's a phrase that means so many different things to so many people that it doesn't actually mean anything to anyone. Um, but something that is more uh, engaging with all of the interested parties would be useful. Uh, I don't think Google particularly wants to do that. Um, they, you know, it's not a coincidence that suddenly the cases where people were being deleted from, uh, from The Guardian and other newspapers appeared suddenly in those papers first very conveniently rather than the tens of thousands of other things they received. So I think they were, you know, they've been gaming the system themselves. Um, but it would be good to see something better designed by more than just them. Uh, something that has all of us engaged in, in discussing what it is. Uh, and then maybe one last point. James was, talk James was talking about uh, you know, a business in going through court records. And of course, that actually is a business that's quite profitable for companies like LexisNexis and Axiom and, and uh, Equifax and TransUnion and all these other companies. So that one is out there in the first place. And that's actually why a lot of these data protection laws exist. Because there was a concern, data protection really started not with Brandeis, but with um, public protests, something that we've just been lamenting that there isn't so much of, against national ID card systems and national databases, combined databases in the US, the Netherlands, and Germany back in the 1960s. These were big debates. Uh, in Australia in the, in the 1980s, it practically led to the fall of the government. Uh, which then led to the creation of Privacy International, so you can thank the Australian government for finding uh, the only international privacy organization out there. Uh, 
So these debates, uh, you know, cause this, and these intermediaries, these infomediaries, uh, have been around for decades. Uh, the reason why Mexico has a Data Protection Act is because it turned out one of these intermediaries was either buying or bribing people in the Mexican government for all the databases of, of people's uh, driver's license records and other public records that were not public but held by government databases, uh, held by government agencies. They were bribing and then putting these into government databases and then turning around and into their private databases and turning around and selling it to the U.S. government. So that was the way of the U.S. government <coughs> spying on Mexican citizens by bribing people in Mexico, government officials in Mexico to give databases to private corporations. That's why there's a Data Protection Act in Mexico. Uh, so these debates do come up from time to time, and when one of these privacy Chernobyls, as we like to call them a while, uh, quite a while ago, happened, there is a response. Um, so, you know, the fact that we see wrapping this, turning this back into Google Spain, it was an inevitable result of Google's collection of personal data uh, without any kind of real control that something was going to happen. And this is what happened because of the absence of any kind of limitations on what they could do um, based on their location in the U.S. Thank you.